betwixt and between patterns of masculine and feminine initiation, edited by Louise Mahdi, Stephen Foster, and Meredith Little. The Meaning of Depression at Significant Stages of Life by V. Walter Odishnik. In his essay, The Meaning of Depression at Significant Stages of Life, V. Walter Odishnik stresses the need for and the positive value of depression as part and parcel of the transitional process. Tracing the development of Jung's ideas about depression, the author demonstrates how the contents of the unanalyzed unconscious, the shadow or negrito, regenerate the psyche and develop the personality, particularly at adolescence and midlife. He examines Jung's use of alchemy as a metaphor of psychic transformation. Because depression or mania follow on the heels of an initial contact with the unconscious, the negrito or separatio must be encountered and endured for the sake of raising consciousness. Odeznik reminds us that every significant change in life, status, role, attitude, or personality is accompanied by the demise and mourning of a former condition. Only through such dark nights of the soul is the person reborn into a new way of being and living. V. Walter Odeznik, Ph.D., is a psychotherapist practicing in New York City. He is a graduate of the C.G. Jung Institute of Zurich, an author of Marxism and Existentialism and Jung and Politics, the Political and Social Ideas of C.G. Jung. C.G. Jung made a significant contribution to our understanding of the psychology of depression. His most shocking discovery was that in its natural condition, the unconscious is in a depressive state, the usual symptoms associated with depression. The feelings of inadequacy, inertia, heaviness, sadness, blackness, lack of interest in life and the pull towards death are apt descriptions of the lower depths of the psyche. It is no wonder that consciousness, normally activated by the opposite principles, spirit, light, energy, joy, curiosity, fights vigorously not to fall into the hands of the unconscious. And with the help of the disclosures that the psyche itself makes in the alchemical treatises, Jung discovered two other startling facts that the unconscious deplores its depressed condition and longs to be made free of it, and that within its blackness it contains a germ of consciousness capable of unifying the conscious and unconscious parts of the psyche, thereby healing the split soul of man. In what follows, I want to describe the evolution of Jung's ideas about the nature of depression. To begin with, he thought it was a compensatory response by the unconscious to one-sided or erroneous conscious attitudes and behavior. Next, he saw depression and mania as two possible reactions on the part of an ego consciousness that has become aware of the powers of the unconscious and feels its stability and formally assumes superiority threatened. In Symbols of Transformation, he describes depression as an aspect of the regressive tendency associated with the incest longing. The regression occurs because an obstacle is encountered in conscious development or social adaptation and there is a need for a renewal and a rechanneling of the flow of psychic energy. This is particularly true at two crucial stages of life, the passage from youth to adulthood and the passage from adulthood to the maturity of old age. Finally, with alchemy, Jung came upon the initially given black state of the unconscious and his desire to unite with consciousness. The manifestations and dynamics resulting from this urge of the unconscious parallel the process of individual maturation and involve a series of depressions as an integral part of such development. Depression as Compensation Noticing the similarity of symptoms in mourning and melancholia, Freud speculated that psychic libido withdraws into the unconscious because of the loss of the love object. If the loss is conscious, mourning results. If it is unconscious, depression. The self-deprecatory aspect of depression, absent in mourning, Freud ascribed to the basic love, hate, ambivalence inherent in all intimate relationships and the turning of the negative feelings onto the part of the ego that had identified with the lost love object. Jung's notion for the reason of the withdrawal of libido into the unconscious during a depression was quite different. He thought it had to do with compensation. In two essays on analytical psychology, Jung is an example of what he means. He writes that while in America he was consulted by a 45-year-old man who for 25 years concentrated all his energy in the one-sided way peculiar to successful American businessmen, says Jung, to build an immense enterprise. He then retired, intent on enjoying the fruits of his labor. But instead of being able to live, by which he meant the pursuit of sports, 
horses, women, and cars. He had a complete nervous breakdown and became a depressed hypochondriac. What happened? A compensation to his former one-sided conscious attitude set in. Having lived in a focused mental way, his physical and emotional life was ignored. Unfortunately, our psychic energy is not always ours to command at will. Also, the psyche has goals that lie beyond conscious goals and can even be inimical to them. He was right. His body and his emotions needed attention. But the regulating center of the psyche decided that this was to be done through introversion and not through the extroverted activities that he would have liked. Extroversion being still part of his former conscious attitude. So he fell into a depression and his body started acting up with all sorts of psychosomatic troubles. Now usually, when the conscious world has turned cold, empty, and gray, the unconscious comes to life. But the unconscious does not inherently seem to care for human or conscious needs. Often consciousness can suffer, hunger, and freeze, while the unconscious grows lush and green. This inimical stance of the unconscious normally has a meaning. It wants to restore a certain balance or bring some content to consciousness. And if the unconscious is extremely inimical to consciousness, it means that the conscious attitude was, or continues to be, false or pretentious toward the unconscious, ignoring it, overpowering it, manipulating it, and, in general, disregarding its needs and limitations. The businessman's depression and hypochondria were signs that his psychic energy had receded into the unconscious and started a compensatory onslaught against the previous conscious behaviors and attitudes. Having been ignored and repressed for so many years, now with the relaxation of tension, it began to pursue its own ends and make its own demands on consciousness. When this happens, it is imperative quickly to turn to the unconscious and establish a relationship with it. That means the businessman had to take his hypochondriacal symptoms seriously and pursue the unconscious energy of which they were an expression. This would entail his bringing the unconscious energy to consciousness through the fantasy images, images being the only way that psychic energy can be caught, that are usually associated with such symptoms. Had he succeeded in becoming conscious of the images and of their meaning, and incorporated all this into his conscious attitude, he might have been cured, as well as changed. That, of course, is the problem. People often want to change but are terribly afraid, especially if they find they will have little conscious control over the process and the results of the change, or if the change calls for a radical about-face in their ideological, moral, social, or professional lives. In the case of the businessman, the compensation that set in was extreme, and Jung was not successful in getting him to bring up his unconscious fantasies. A case so far advanced, he concludes, can only be cared for until death. It can hardly be cured. The other example of a psychogenetic depression that Jung gives is in two essays, is in the chapter entitled Phenomena Resulting from the Assimilation of the Unconscious. Here he speaks of depression as a result of an initial contact with the unconscious. Whether that contact is unintentional, for example, when the unconscious bursts forth into conscious because of fatigue, drugs, stress, or some life trauma, or whether it is deliberately cultivated during analysis by bringing up fantasy images, depression or mania is the result. In some people, the contact with the unconscious leads to an accentuation of ego consciousness, I in self-confidence, bordering on God almightiness. In others, their self-confidence dwindles and they look on with resignation at all the extraordinary things the unconscious produces. The former assume a responsibility for the unconscious that goes much too far, identifying their ego with its psychic energy and extra human contents. The latter gives up all sense of responsibility in the overwhelming realization of the powerlessness of the ego against the fates that rule it. One becomes a god, the other just a worthless worm. These are the extreme reactions. Most people fall somewhere in between. If looked at analytically, the conscious optimism is really a compensation for deep-seated feelings of insecurity and helplessness. While well, the pessimistic resignation hides a defiant will to power, in the latter case, therefore, the depression is caused by an unconscious or consciously denied will to power. Marie-Louise von Franz writes that often behind a psychogenetic depression, there is an especially intense desire of some sort, whether for power, love, success, aggression, getting things one's own way, and so on, which the person, for a variety of reasons, won't allow to come to the surface. In many instances, the drive is so inordinate and irrational that, in fact, it has to be repressed. 
but often it has gotten that disturbed because it lies buried in the unconscious where it becomes attached to one of the instincts or to the complex and then takes on the all or nothing reaction characteristic of unintegrated instincts or complexes. So part of the business of bringing these fantasy contents to consciousness is to humanize them, to give them rational and moral limits. But to start with, that too produces depression. For losing a secretly cherished hope, hate, or drive, we feel disillusioned and diminished. No, you can't have what you want, it's too late or impossible. How often that comes up in an analysis, in one form or another. Most of us don't want to hear that. We prefer to hold on to our godlike desires of getting the world the way we want it. This also applies to projections, how strenuously we, or rather, something in us, fights to maintain them in the face of all objective evidence. We just refuse to look at the facts staring us in the face. It cannot be so. And if a correction is forced on us by undeniable events, how often we withdraw into a lofty sense of injury, which is just another way of not giving up. Well, perhaps it didn't work out this time, we say. Or, you see, this always happens to me. But even if the correction is made willingly, and one really does give up, still a depression follows because the psychic energy that was invested in the projection no longer flows back to us, but has been cut off. It then has to be sought in the unconscious. And if that is done properly, another bit of the unconscious is made part of the conscious structure, and the psychic energy formerly streaming out towards the world remains within. This is the case, for example, when men and women, after repeated disappointments, discover that what their romantic fascinations are mostly about is the need for a relationship with the anima or the animus, or with as yet unrealized characteristic or potential of their own psyche. It may make one depressed to realize these things, but at least this form of depression is inherently constructive. It can force us to focus on the necessary internal changes and give up lamenting repeated disappointments, about which one can't do anything anyway. Jung's early personal discovery that depression or mania follow on the heels of an initial contact with the unconscious was later confirmed by his study of alchemy, where the negrito is the product of the first alchemical operation. Even though the negrito is usually depicted as a death-like state, it is also sometimes described as a condition of extreme agitation and restlessness. Here is a second century Chinese alchemical description of suffering caused by a technical error during the opus. Disaster will then come to the black mass, or to the unconscious, to the psyche. Gases from food consumed, the contents assimilated by consciousness, will make noises inside the intestines and stomach. One must take all of this both somatically and psychologically. The right essence will be exhaled and the evil one inhaled. Days and night will be passed without sleep, moon after moon. The body will be tired out, giving rise to an appearance of insanity. The hunched pulses will stir and boil so violently as to drive away peace in mind. Ghostly things will make their appearance, at which the alchemist will marvel even in his sleep. He is then led to rejoice, thinking that he is assured of longevity, but all of a sudden he is seized by an untimely death. This is a description of a manic depressive psychosis, an unfortunate assimilation of ego consciousness by the contents of the unconscious. This form of the negrito is not caused by an initial contact with the unconscious. It is said to be the result of an erroneous attitude or a mistaken intervention during the therapeutic process. Every analyst, like every physician, has his or her share of technical errors, which sometimes end in tragedy. Fortunately, most mistakes do not produce reactions of such magnitude, but they do disturb the process and the health of the patient and of the analyst. The above is a description of a depression that passed into a psychosis and then death. More common are depressions characterized by restlessness and agitation that do not turn psychotic or fatal. It seems to me that the alchemists and Jung after them tended to emphasize the value of the heavy, black, death-like aspects of the Negrito, and to downplay its agitated, restless, frenzied manifestations. I think their emphasis is right. Agitated depression is not yet a real depression. It is an attempt on the part of the person to fight off the depression and to maintain the dominance of ego consciousness. In this form, the depression is useless for any psychological growth or healing. Only those depressions are useful and healing in which the ego stays intact with the willing to compromise and the pressing drives and needs of the unconscious.
Mania, the other reaction to initial contact with the unconscious, is also not emphasized by the alchemists or by Jung, nor does it seem to be treated as a valuable or useful stage. This is probably due to the introverted bias of the alchemists and of Jung, a bias for her self-knowledge and inner development, as opposed to trying to improve others in the world. Yet a mania in which the ego remains intact and attempts to channel the energy streaming into consciousness from the unconscious can also be a healthy and life-giving phenomenon. Many creative, religious, and humanitarian endeavors are fueled in this way. By engaging in responsible interactions with people and with the external world, the manic-driven individual may also be led to inner development and self-knowledge. Therapeutically, it would be a mistake to try and force mania into a depression, even if that were possible. Mania is usually a compensation for deep-seated feelings of insecurity, helplessness, and worthlessness. It is probably preferable to a depression brought on by inferiority feelings of such magnitude. But there is another form of mania that Jung does not mention. It is, however, implied in his concept of anatio dormia, and in the change of the negrito into the albedo, as a second alchemical stage. When a depression has reached its nadir, a reversal sets in, and the psyche moves into a manic phase. Everything is suddenly reversed. The symptomatology is directly opposite to that of depression. The previously hidden will to power is now in the open, while the formerly conscious feelings of inferiority fall into the unconscious. In most cases, such an extreme swing denotes a weak ego or a severely disturbed and unbalanced psyche, hence the classification manic depressive psychosis. Depression and Renewal Jung's initial ideas on depression were further developed in Symbols of Transformation. Symbols is an expansion of the first of the two essays on the psychology of the unconscious begun in 1911 through 1912. Jung was then 36 and had just broken with Freud. I mention this because both his age and his break with Freud brought on a long-lasting depression to which he conscientiously devoted himself for many years. The creative fruit of that depression is analytical psychology. In Symbols of Transformation, Jung again stresses the compensatory nature of depression. Depression, he writes, should be regarded as an unconscious compensation whose content must be made conscious if it is to be fully effective. This can only be done by consciously regressing along with the depressive tendency and integrating the memory so activated into the conscious mind, which was what the depression was aiming at in the first place. But this time he examines in some detail the unconscious world into which the depression leads. He begins where Freud ends, with the incest longing, the desire to return to the womb. He doesn't think that the longing should be taken literally. Instead, he sees it as an expression of a psychological longing for a return to the security of childhood and early youth, when the person lived without responsibility as an appendage of the parents and in blissful harmony with instinctive nature. The temptation for such a regression to the world of childhood takes place whenever a person is confronted with the task of adapting and growing psychologically and socially. But the other reason for the regression is a desire for renewal, for if the process of conscious adaptation has encountered an obstacle, a new attitude or channel for the flow of life's energy is required. This flow of energy can move only along certain given instinctive paths. As the example of the businessman shows, we are not at liberty to decide the flow of essential psychic energy. The ego has some leeway with the surplus psychic energy. This is what we call free will. Surplus psychic energy at the disposal of the ego. But in a depression where there is hardly any surplus energy at the ego's disposal, there is hardly any choice in directing one's functioning. Therefore, it becomes necessary to return to the instincts, to pay attention to where they want to move, and begin a new journey from there. But this is easier said than done, and the process is fraught with great danger along the way. This is the other important issue Jung begins to stress. Regression carried to its logical conclusion means a linking back with the world of natural instincts, which in its formal or ideal aspect is a kind of prima materia. If this prima materia can be assimilated by the conscious mind, it will bring about a reactivation and reorganization of its contents. But if the conscious mind proves incapable of assimilating the new contents pouring in from the unconscious, then a dangerous situation arises in which they keep their original chaotic and archaic form and consequently disrupt the unit of consciousness. A severe psychosis is the result. In another place, Jung writes, Whenever some great work is to be accomplished, be it a task 
of life adaptation or some creative effort before which a man recoils, doubtful of his strength, his libido streams back to the fountainhead. And that is the dangerous moment when the issue hangs between annihilation and new life. For if the libido gets stuck in the wonderland of the inner world, then for the upper world man is nothing but a shadow. He is already moribund or at least seriously ill. But if the libido manages to tear itself loose and force its way up again, something like a miracle happens. The journey to the underworld was a plunge into the fountain of youth, and the libido, apparently dead, wakes to renewed fruitfulness. A good part of Symbols of Transformation is concerned with illustrating and amplifying the universal manifestation of this process with various mythological accounts of night sea journeys, descents into the underworld, and with stories, poems, and religious rituals of death and rebirth. In this book, Jung stresses two periods of life where an adaptation is required and a severe depression is likely to occur. One is at the stage where a separation must be made from the world of the parents so that the libido can begin to flow outside toward the broader world. In this case, the regressive longing must not be encouraged beyond the point necessary to get things moving again. Here, not the courageous descent into the unconscious is required, but rather a courageous sacrifice of the retrospective longing and a wholehearted dedication to life is what's called for. This too cannot be done without the aid of the unconscious. But at this stage, it usually does help by throwing up the incest taboo in the form of various frightening emotions and terrifying images that threaten to swallow the still youthful ego. It requires an unusual pool of the parents or a serious problem of adaptation, often having its roots in the inherent tendencies or in an earlier developmental stage. For the incest taboo on the one side and the pool of exogamous libido on the other to fail to get the person out of the unconscious parental milieu. Experimentation with psychedelic drugs or the abuse of alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and other conscious altering drugs are a detrimental to the proper development of the ego at this point in life. For they tend to overpower the incest taboo, the natural fear of the unconscious, and support the retrospective longing that only wants to resuscitate the torpid bliss and effortlessness of childhood. Should a person fail to tear himself loose of his family fixations and of his unconscious fantasies and longings, and so free his libido for social and other purposes, he will fall under the spell of the unconscious compulsions. Wherever he goes, he will recreate the infantile milieu by projecting his complexes, thus reproducing the same dependence and lack of freedom that characterized his relation to his parents. The libido then remains fixed in a primitive form and keeps people on a low level where they have no control over themselves and are at the mercy of their affects. Needless to say, such a condition just leads to bouts of frustration, anger, rage, depression, a search for an escape from the intolerable situation, and after a time, a fall back into another similar situation. Sometimes, unfortunately, the escape ends in a serious illness, a psychosis, or a suicide all of which, in such cases, must be looked upon as unsuccessful attempts at self-healing and renewal. The other place where a severe depression occurs is at midlife, when a metatonia, a basic reorientation of one's attitudes and goals is called for. In this instance, just the opposite stance toward the unconscious is required, for by now, typically the ego has become firmly established. The person is well grounded in the material world with parental, social, professional responsibilities. In other cases, the conscious attitude has become one-sided and then sterile. Life seems to have run dry. Enthusiasm for the things that once meant so much wanes or completely disappears, and the person falls into a stupor, questioning the purpose and meaning of all that she or he has done and should supposedly continue doing. At this juncture, it becomes necessary to follow the depressive tendency into the unconscious in order to bring up the saving contents and to discover where and how the libido wants to flow again into the world. This requires two things. One, the willingness to let go of one's habitual conscious attitudes and assumptions, particularly one's so-called reasonable convictions about the world, and two, overcoming of the fear of incest, i.e. of the repulsion and anxiety that contact with the unconscious often calls forth. This is what all those frog princes and princesses, the dragons, and other ugly beasts of the fairy tales are all about. Jung gives a beautiful description of both the early and midlife phases in one of my favorite passages in all of his writings. It is a long quotation, but well worth the time and space. The sun, rising triumphant, tears himself from the enveloping womb of the sea, 
and leaving behind him the noonday zenith and all its glorious works sinks down again into the maternal depths, into all enfolding and all regenerating night. This image is undoubtedly a primordial one, and there was profound justification for its becoming a symbolic expression of human fate. In the morning of life, the sun tears himself loose from the mother, from the domestic hearth, to raise through battle to his destined heights. Always he imagines his worst enemy in front of him, yet he carries the enemy within himself, a deadly longing for the abyss, a longing to drown in his own source, to be sucked down to the realm of the mothers. His life is a constant struggle against extinction, a violent yet fleeting deliverance from his ever-lurking night. This death is no external enemy. It is his own inner longing for the stillness and profound peace of all-knowing non-existence. For all seeing sleep in the ocean of coming to be and passing away, even in his highest strivings for harmony and balance, for the profundities of philosophy and the raptures of the artist, he seeks death, immobility, rest. If like Perithus he tarries too long in this abode of rest and peace, he is overcome by apathy, and the poison of the serpent paralyzes him for all time. If he is to live, he must fight and sacrifice his longing for the past in order to rise to his own heights. And having reached his noonday heights, he must sacrifice his love for his own achievement, for he may not loiter. The sun, too, sacrifices his greatest strength in order to hasten onward to the fruits of autumn, which are the seeds of rebirth. The natural course of life demands that the young person should sacrifice his childhood and his childish dependence on the physical parents, lest he remain caught body and soul in the bonds of unconscious incest. This regressive tendency has been consistently opposed from the most primitive times by the great psychotherapeutic systems which we know as the religions. They seek to create an autonomous consciousness by weaning mankind away from the sleep of childhood. The sun breaks from the mists of the horizon and climbs to undimmed brightness in the meridian. Once this goal is reached, it sinks down again towards night. This process can be allegorized as a gradual seeping away of the waters of life. One has to bend over deeper to reach the source. When we are feeling on top of the world, we find this exceedingly disagreeable. We resist the sunset tendency especially when we suspect that there is something in ourselves which would like to follow this movement. For behind it, we sense nothing good, only an obscure, hateful threat. So, as soon as we feel ourselves slipping, we begin to combat this tendency and erect barriers against the dark, rising flood of the unconscious in its enticements to regression, which all too easily take on the deceptive guise of sacrosy, ideas, principles, beliefs, etc., if we wish to stay on the heights we have achieved, we must struggle all the time to consolidate our consciousness and its attitude. But we soon discover that this praiseworthy and apparently unavoidable battle with the years leads to stagnation and dissection of the soul. Our convictions become platitudes ground out on a barrel organ, our ideals become starchy habits, enthusiasm stiffens into automatic gestures, the source of the water of life seeps away. We ourselves may not notice it, but everybody else does, and that is even more painful. If we should risk a little introspection, coupled perhaps with an energetic attempt to be honest for once with ourselves, we may get a dim idea of all the wants, longings, and fears that have accumulated down there, a repulsive and sinister sight. The mind shies away, but life wants to flow down into the depths. Fate itself seems to preserve us from this. Fate itself seems to preserve us from this, because each of us has a tendency to become an immovable pillar of the past. Nevertheless, the demon throws us down, makes us traitors to our ideals and cherished convictions, traitors to the selves we thought we were. That is an unmitigated catastrophe, because it is an unwilling sacrifice. Things go very differently when the sacrifice is a voluntary one, then it is no longer an overthrow transvaluation of values, the destruction of all that we held sacred, the transformation and conservation. Everything young grows old, all beauty fades, all heat cools, all brightness dims, and every truth becomes stale and trite. 
where all these things have taken on shape and all shapes are worn thin by the working of time. They age, sicken, and crumble to dust unless they change. But change they can, for the invisible spark that generated them is potent enough for infinite generation. No one should deny the dangers of the set, but it can be risked. No one need risk it, but it is certain that someone will. And let those who go down the sunset way do so with open eyes, for it is a sacrifice which daunts even the gods. Yet every descent is followed by an ascent. The vanishing shapes are shaped anew, and the truth is valid in the end only if it suffers change and bears new witness to new images and new tongues, like an old wine that is put into new bottles. Depression and the Negrito Around 1930, soon after his own descent into the underworld, Jung stumbled, as he says, upon alchemy. At first he thought it was utter nonsense. Many people, including beginning analysts, are familiar with that feeling. But if one takes the trouble, one finds, like Jung, that the alchemical symbols and processes are so often encountered in analytical practice that, once mastered, they serve as guideposts along what is usually a murky and confusing journey. That was essentially what alchemy did for Jung. It enabled him to place his personal psychological discoveries in the context of centuries-old tradition that provided a non-personal, objective depiction of the stages of psychic development. For example, he knew a good deal about depression before he came to alchemy, but the entire phenomena was placed in a much broader context with his studies of the Negrito, its various symbols, symptoms, and outcomes. The alchemists, Jung writes, were like modern men. They preferred immediate personal experience to belief in traditional ideas or dogmas. For many people, the Christian drama gave, and still gives, a satisfactory expression to the unconscious and its archetypal contents. Such people live contained within the Christian world, and Christ is their protective image or amulet against the unconscious powers that always threaten to possess or swallow the ego personality. Jesus saves and he saves one from evil, destruction, and death. Even when a Christian takes up his own cross and seeks his own death as a lived inner reality, he does so supported by a clearly defined tradition and the assurance of resurrection. However, once the Christian myth fades, as it has for many in our day, the individual is once again exposed to the powers of destruction, alone and with no assurances of any kind. But even when the myth is intact, there are always people for whom the ruling expression of the collective religious life is not wholly satisfying. They set out on a search for direct individual experience. Following the lure of the unconscious psyche, they soon find themselves in the wilderness, where, like Jesus, they come up against the sun of darkness, then follow a fateful encounter leading either to their salvation or destruction. On the whole, the alchemists were still safe, for they projected all the evil upon matter, Nevertheless, they were affected by it. Purge the horrible darkness of our mind, light, a light for our senses. This was a prayer of an old adept, who must have been going through the first stage of the work, which was felt, Jung writes, as melancholia, and corresponds to the encounter with the shadow in psychology. The alchemists dubbed this experience the Negrito. It only brought decay, suffering, death, and the torments of hell, visibly before an alchemist's eyes, but... It also cast the shadow of its melancholy over his own solitary soul, in the blackness of a despair which was not his own, and of which he was merely the witness. He experienced how it turned into the worm and the poisonous dragon. Here is the further development of Jung's understanding of the psychology of depression. There are usually four stages in the alchemical opus, Negrito, a blackening, Albedo, a whitening, Citronitas, a yellowing, and Rubido, a reddening. One of the alchemists noted the association of these four colors with the four humors and the four temperaments, Negrito with melancholic, Albedo with phlegmatic, Citronitas with caloric, and Rubido with sanguine. Negrito is the initial stage. Sometimes it corresponds with the prima materia, or it is a quality of it. It is then described as the black earth in which the gold or lapis is sown like a grain of wheat. Another variation has it as the earth that Adam brought with him from paradise. This initially given earth is described as negrum, negress, negro, black, blacker than black. At other times, the primary material is called chaos or massa confucia.
In this case, it represents the state prior to creation. In fact, it has a thousand names and characteristics, and they are all essentially synonymous for the unconscious in its initial, natural, raw, or we could say unanalyzed state, and an encounter with or a fall into the dark, chaotic foundation of our being inevitably produces a depression. But the negrito is not only or always a quality of the primal materia, it can also appear as a consequence of a separation of the basic elements making up the primal materia. The opus is often linked to the creation of the world, and the Grito is the dawn state. Looked at psychologically, the creation of the world has to do with the origin of consciousness, the fall from paradise, knowledge of good and evil, and the experience of shame and guilt. The curse of toil, suffering and death are all analogies to the Negrito that is the result of a separatio. A more contemporary and specific example would be as follows. Many people come for therapy, more or less in good spirits seeking to untangle some problem or conflict. In the course of the work, if it has to go deep enough, they become unsure of themselves, confused and disoriented and depressed. In other words, they have fallen from what appeared to them as a whole and healthy state into one where they are miserable and at odds with themselves. The union of two opposed elements will also give rise to a state of negrito. For example, Say a person has already done some work on the unconscious in the course of his or her life or through analysis, but seeks a still closer union. Or suppose a person comes to analysis with a highly developed one-sided conscious attitude. Let us say it is overdeveloped eros, to get away with the usual example of the thinking type. A union must now be brought about with the opposite principle, with the underdeveloped logos, which has probably become cold, unrelated, and dogmatic by way of compensation. The union of conscious and unconscious eros and logos having been accomplished, a death follows and a corresponding negrito. In alchemy, this is called the negrito of the first operation. Psychologically, one would say that a certain integration of the opposites has taken place and a better relation is established with the unconscious. But as time goes on, life or a continuing analysis may again bring up certain problems or conflicts and another separation and union must be brought about. This union is again followed by a mortificatio, a death. This would be the negrito of the second operation. In fact, since there are usually seven or sometimes eight operations, there is a corresponding negrito for each operation, so that one of the Greek treatises describes the alchemical opus as the eight graves. Normally, the first negrito is considered the worst, but there is no guarantee that this will always be the case. It depends on the nature of the personality and the difficulties that must be overcome along the way. In any case, some of the alchemists were optimistic about things. Meyer, for instance, writes, This is in our chemistry a certain noble substance, in the beginning whereof is wretchedness with vinegar, but in its ending joy with gladness. Therefore I have supposed that the same will happen to me, namely that I shall suffer difficulty, grief, and weariness at first, but in the end shall come to glimpse pleasanter and easier things. The first negrito is seen as the worst, perhaps because with the person's first severe depression, there is no sense that it has a useful purpose and no experience that one will ever come out of it. Psychologically, the initial negrito corresponds to the darkness of the unconscious, which contains in the first place the inferior personality, the shadow. In a man, this then changes into the feminine figure that stands behind the shadow and, in fact, controls it the anima. In a woman, behind the shadow stands the masculine figure of the animus. The negrito therefore leads to an encounter with the shadow and then with the animus and the anima, initially in their black, unredeemed, unconscious state. If the conscious mind allows itself to be influenced by these figures, it must inevitably become inflicted with their blackness and turn melancholic. But that is exactly how they are redeemed and made less black, while the conscious mind becomes less clear and bright and less cheerful. But this is putting it much too simplistically. Here is how the feminine personification of the primal material laments being in the state of Negrito. Through Sham the Egyptian I must pass. No one must wash me in the deepest sea that my blackness may depart. I must be fixed to this black cross and must be clean therefrom from wretchedness and vinegar and made white that my heart may shine like a carbuncle. The old Adam come forth from me again. O oh, Adam Kodmon, how beautiful art thou. Like dear I am black henceforth. How long? Come my message, 
and disrobe me, that mine inner beauty may be revealed. O Shalomu, afflicted within and without, the watchmen of the great city will find thee and wound thee and rob thee of my garments and take away thy veil. O might afflicted within and without, the watchmen of the great city will find thee and wound thee and rob thee of thy garments and take away thy veil. Who then will lead me out from Edom, from the stout wall? Yet shall I be blissful again when I am delivered from the poison wherewith I am accursed, and my inmost seed and first birth come forth, for its father is the sun and its mother the moon. Jung gives a detailed interpretation of this passage in Mysterium Conectionis. It is full of Old and New Testament allusions. Adam Kadman is the original Adam, before the creation of Eve and before the fall. He is the first birth whose father is the sun and mother the moon. Symbolically, he represents the Anthropos, the primordial universal being, hermaphroditic, whole and immortal. He corresponds to the Atman of the Vedic tradition. Like the Atman, he is the paradoxical individual and universal soul of man. The psychological implication of the passage is that after the unconscious undergoes a series of painful analytic procedures, it can give birth to a completely transformed and integrated personality, the germ of which lies hidden within its depth. The other striking thing is that here we see how the unconscious feels about its own depressed condition. It longs for deliverance and promises a rebirth of the entire personality to anyone who takes the trouble to help. This is another example of the importance that alchemy has for an understanding of the human psyche and of the psychology of depression. In the alchemical treatises, the collective Western psyche describes its own condition, its dynamic processes, and its ultimate goal. Another way of seeing the Negrito is as a description of the original half-animal state of the unconscious, the inextricable interweaving of a soul with the body which together form a dark unity. The aim of the entire alchemical opus was to rescue the light spirit that had fallen into the embrace of dark matter. Similarly, analysis works to free the soul from its enchainment from instinct and matter in order to establish a spiritual psychic counterposition that will prove to be more or less immune to the influences of the body and of the external environment. The establishment of such a counterposition is possible only if the projections that veil the reality of things are withdrawn. Once this unconscious identity comes to an end, the soul is free from its fetters in the things of sense. This, of course, can be said in a sentence, but to accomplish it takes a lifetime. In psychology and alchemy, and in Mysterium Connectionis, one can look up most of the synonyms and the symbols of the Negrito. This is not just an idle game. These symbols come up in dreams and fantasies more often than one would expect. We just are not always able to recognize them. Churchill, for example, was plagued during his entire life with bouts of depression. They were so familiar that they called them his black dog. Now the black dog is one of the symbols of the Negrito, as is the mad or rabbit dog. The black earth we already mentioned at times appears as black, heavy, oily water or mud or manure or feces. There is Mercurius as the dragon eating its own tail. This motif comes up often enough as a fleshy circle of some kind. There is the black sun or the eclipse sun, and also the dark crescent new moon. One sees these in a lot of pictures by Anna Lazarus. Then there is the raven, the black bird, the black soul, or the raven's head. The raven is a symbol of the devil and of Saturn. I've never encountered the raven's head, but black birds are common enough in dreams. Then there is the skeleton, or the skull, or the head of the black Osiris. Yet again, with the exception of the head of the black Osiris, the skull and the skeleton come up frequently. A very common motif is that of a crippled, sick, or dying old man, the dying or sterile king of the myths and fairy tales. Then there is the buried man, Osiris, Christ, tombs and coffins. Any black man or black woman is a symbol of the Negrito. In alchemy, they often go under the names of the Ethiopian, the Moor, the Egyptian, or the Shulamite, of the Song of Songs. In the United States, these come up so often as blacks and Hispanics. The state of incubation, meditation, pregnancy are all Negrito analogs. So is the suffering of Job and the passion of Christ. Salt with its bitterness is an infrequent synonym. So is lead. So bedeviled and shameless is lead that all who wish to investigate it fall into madness through ignorance, writes an alchemist. 
Like fumes are poisonous and give rise to psychotic symptoms, hence the projection of the devil onto it and its use as a symbol for the negrito. Incidentally, lead poisoning is still called Saturnism. I hope this brief list and the above discussion demonstrate what a rich source alchemy is for a comprehensive understanding of depression, its symbols, causes, phases, and aims. In conclusion, I think it appropriate to give the negrito the last word. Be turned to me with all your heart and do not cast me aside because I am black and swarthy. Because the sun hath changed my color, and the waters have covered my face, and the land hath been polluted and defiled in my works. For there was darkness over it, because I stick fast in the mire of the deep, and my substance is not disclosed. Wherefore out of the depths have I cried, and from the abyss of the earth, with my voice to all you that pass by the way, attend and see me. If any shall find one like unto me, I will give into his hand the morning star. The morning star is Venus. It heralds the coming of the light, the rebirth of the sun from its sojourn in the underworld. In the last chapter of Revelation, which anticipates the coming of the kingdom of God, Christ says of himself, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The kingdom of God and the risen sun are symbols of completion and enlightenment. Psychologically, they indicate the attainment of wholeness and self-realization.